All right. Good morning. So I'm, I'm used to the, the mask thing at uh, Ethnos 360 over in Waukesha. The students are wearing masks now. Uh, I think there's a certain advantage, you know, if, uh, for the student anyway. If they're frowning at me, I can't tell, right? So that's what, uh, that's what we'll go with today, too. If you're frowning or if you're yawning underneath there, I can't see it. One thing I can see really good, though, is the eyes, right? So if your eyes are starting to close, we'll get that. Okay. <laughs> so really good to be here with you uh, this morning. Really glad to be uh, fellowshipping with you. Just thinking about the the songs we were singing, I was I was tearing up, you guys, um, especially that last song. Uh, I think about the Old Testament priests uh, when they would come into the temple and lead worship uh, uh, before God. The concept in their mind, or the idea in their mind, is that they were coming into uh, God's throne room. Okay, the, 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 the temple that was like God's throne room or part of God's throne room, right? There's these passages in the Old Testament that say, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, right? So in a sense, when the priests would come in to lead the worship of the nation of Israel before God, they were coming to, to kneel before the throne of God. It was like the place where heaven and earth meet, where they touch, you know, so we're right in there worshiping God. Of course, you know the story where Isaiah goes in there to worship and uh, all of a sudden he sees God sitting on his throne. The connection was opened up and he, and he saw that. Um, I, I know, I just was thinking about that as we were, as we were worshiping and, and saying, crown him with the crowns, you know. We get the privilege of doing that in our worship uh, before it happens for real. There will come a day where Jesus will come down here and they'll put the crown on his head and we'll all cheer, you know. I look forward to that. Um, but we do that in our worship uh, in the meantime, in the interim, as we wait for the coming. So that was just a blessing to me. That's not the sermon. That's just the thought I had. <laughs> thought I had. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at uh, part of the book of Hebrews. I've had the privilege this last um, month, and then going forward into December, I will have the privilege of studying the book of Hebrews in seminary, and I'm really enjoying it. I've always liked the book of Hebrews. There's some scary things in there, obviously, and some really encouraging things. And uh, just going through the first couple of chapters this last month, I thought, boy, if we can get a chance to preach somewhere, you know. And then Jeremy called me, and I'm like, yep, I know what I'm going to do already. So, First three verses of the book is what we're going to look at. If you want an encouraging read sometime, um, I don't know how long it would take you. Maybe maybe an hour, maybe 45 minutes, maybe not even. You'll sit down and read the entire book to yourself and just, just think through the thoughts. It's hard sometimes to outline the book because there's a lot going on. But the lot that's going on is so highly encouraging for a Christian. It's just whether you understand it all or not, there's some really good things in there. Just lift my heart anyway. And I wanted to share some of that with you. Uh, the book of Hebrews is a, a letter, a kind of a letter, um, written by someone who we don't know. We're not sure who it is. Okay, so that's that's kind of fun. It's anonymous anonymous uh, writing. There's lots of guesses. People have tried to figure it out. You know, some people have thought the Apostle Paul, and and, and then the, the list goes on from there. Uh, one of the early church fathers said, uh, as to the book of Hebrews, God only knows. So that's kind of where I hang my hat these days. God only knows. But, you know, we know it's inspired. We know it's part of God's word. And it definitely is an encouragement to the church. So that's, that's what we can know. Uh, the background for the book of Hebrews goes like this. This is written to Jewish Christians, as near as anyone can tell. And Jewish Christians who are starting to experience some persecution for their faith. Okay, so that's not a... Big time reality for us, although once in a while we feel some pressure from the outside world, but uh, for the, the Jewish Christians at this time, first century AD, there's some persecution going on. And you don't have to look too far in the New Testament to see this happening. Uh, one thing I noticed not too long ago was every, every town where the Apostle Paul goes to preach, there's usually some kind of a riot or an altercation or people go to prison or get beaten like it's happening everywhere he goes. And, you, and you're like, why is this? You know, what's the problem here? And you realize a lot of the interactions are negative interactions with Judaism. Hey, Paul is going on the street and saying, Jesus is God's son. Jesus is our Messiah and our Savior. And there's people saying, no way he's not, right? Uh, the, the, the people who put Jesus on the cross had a very strong idea that Jesus was not the son of God and was not the Savior. Uh, so Paul, in his interactions primarily with Judaism, faces a lot of opposition. Okay, so you can imagine, and I hadn't thought about this before until recently, you know, we, th we think all the opposition and stuff centered around the Apostle Paul as he traveled, you know, they threw rocks at him and put him in prison. But imagine what happens when you plant a little, a little, a little group of people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior, and then Paul leaves and goes somewhere else. What happens to those people? They live there. They're not traveling around like Paul. They don't get to leave after two weeks and go somewhere else. That's their home. 
you know? And so the riots and the persecution and maybe the prison, and it, it continues, you know? Um, so it's not hard to believe that there'd be some kind of persecution going on. Now, in the book of Hebrews, uh, we don't have um, a situation where people are being killed for their faith, not yet. In fact, later in the book, uh, chapter 12, he says, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding your blood. That hasn't happened yet. But he does talk about people who've been put in prison, and he talks about people who've had their things taken away. Okay, so there's, there's pressure and there's, there's prison. There's the starting of something happening. Uh, and in all of the persecution that's going on, the pressure, there is a temptation to do something to alleviate the stress. Okay, when we're under stress, we're under pressure, we try to find a safe place to stand, right? Where I can have some sanity and feel good about what I'm doing. And so the place that a lot of the Christians in this book are being faced uh, with, or the place that they're feeling like they need to go to, is to take a step back into Judaism. A lot of these people are Jewish culture people to begin with, right? They were born with that. And Jewish culture has its religion where they are, they're worshiping God through the temple system and all that kind of thing. When Jesus, the son of God comes as a Jewish man into the Jewish world and says, I'm the son of God, I'm the, the hope of the nation of Israel that you've been looking for. The, the, the people who believe that took a, a step forward into something different, right? Into a new family and it, what ended up being a multinational family that God's creating all, out of, all over the world of people who will believe in his son. Judaism got kind of left behind. Judaism's official position is Jesus is not God, right? Judaism at the time in the Roman Empire was an, ex- an accepted religion. Among all the different pagan gods and things like that, there was a place for Judaism. It was ancient. It was respected. There, was, there, was peop- there were people who believed that. And pagans thought the Jews were a little odd, but there wasn't persecution of Jews going on, not at least at this time. Okay? So for a Christian, a Jewish Christian, to kind of pull back into his roots, to pull back into his ethnic heritage a little bit, and just say, yeah, I'm Jewish, and leave it at that, and not name the name of Jesus and say, I'm with him, is a temptation for them. And whoever wrote the book of Hebrews is saying, don't do that. Jesus has come. Jesus is God's man. Jesus is the way. Don't retreat from that. It's going to mean tough times, right? But we have to walk through those things in order to get where God wants to take us in order for us to grow and mature. And uh, pulling back from Jesus is just not an option. Okay. Now the, the writer of Hebrews could write them and say, you know, how dare you turn away from God's son? Don't do it. The end. But he doesn't do that. He writes a 13 chapter book, which in essence, it's not a normal letter. It's kind of more like a sermon on paper. You ever read a sermon before? You know, back in the old days, these guys would write their sermons. This is like a written sermon. It flows like a sermon. And the guy is quoting scripture as he goes and he's telling stories and he's putting this thing together. What he eventually gives us is a beautiful picture of the son of God who loved us and bought us from our sins in his own blood. And he, and, he, and he exalts Jesus to a level, but you get to the end of the book, your head's just swimming with praise for Jesus. And you're like, why would I ever walk away from this? You know, that's the point. And he leaves some warnings in there as well. He's like, boy, if you back up, that's, a, that, you know, that's dangerous with God, right? Because you're going to deny the son now. Like, let's not do that. So there is warning. There is negative talk, but there's so much glorious talk too about Jesus uh, that just fills your heart with love for him and what he did. Some of our most favorite quotes as Christians from the New Testament about what Jesus did, you know, like the sacrifice for our sins, you know, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but by his own blood. That language comes out of this book. Okay. So I want to, I want to read three verses this morning and, um, and then we're going to, to just look through the wording here a little bit. So we'll start at verse one. Um, and I'm reading from the ESV if you wanted to, to know uh, why your Bible is different than mine or why it's the same. <laughs> we as Christians have so many Bibles here in our country, don't we? Some people are waiting for their first turn. All right, verse one. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, now the the reason I didn't go forward into verse 4 is it starts getting to the angels. So I thought I'd leave that off just because there's a lot more to get into there. I think verses 1 through 3 has plenty of material for us to chat about this morning. So we'll do that. Uh, The writer says that long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. God spoke. 
we can be so thankful that we have a God who has not been silent. I often tell my students at the Bible school, you know, God didn't need to tell us anything. Like God didn't need to, to give us a word, uh, an inscripturated word, to speak by his spirit, to speak by anyone. He could have created the world, let it spin off into the cosmos and never touch us again. You know, uh, humans sin and wreck the place. God didn't need to say anything. God didn't need to react. You know, the fact that God was intent on speaking, and he says that many times and in many ways, like it wasn't just a one-off either, it was a lot. God was doing a lot of talking. You know, you read through the Old Testament story that we've got a whole Old Testament, three quarters of our Bible full pages and pages and pages of messages from God. That's incredible. Okay, that kind of material coming, coming from a divine being for, for people who he wants to instruct and love on and encourage, that's, that's big stuff. Through the prophets, of course, we know who the prophets are. Uh, the prophets of, of Israel, God spoke to them as a nation, and they recorded what he gave them. Uh, he says, God spoke to our fathers. The word fathers there is a word that's used by the Jewish people to point to the earlier generations. Okay, so the Jewish fathers, the Jewish predecessors, the ancestors, whatever. So through, through our history, God has been speaking to us, to our people primarily. Uh, Jewish nation, of course, as we know, was set up to be a light or a beacon to the, to the world, right? The messages were given to them, but not just for them, for everyone else to see God as well and get to know him. So long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke. God was speaking to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Let's stop there. In these last days, it's an interesting way that he calls the time in which he lives. You know, we look at our, our world right now, and some of us begin to question, I wonder if we're living in the last days, okay? The author of Hebrews says, in these last days, um, this is a, a, a point that's actually made in the New Testament a number of times. Uh, near as I can tell, the perspective of the early church is that with the coming of Jesus, God began his end time plan. The days of fulfillment are starting to happen. It's not everything. Everything hasn't happened, right? The kingdom hasn't arrived yet. Jesus hasn't sat on the throne. But with the entrance of the Son of Man into the world, the clock starts ticking. We're in the end days type of thing. It's going to wrap up. Now we look at history right now. We say, my goodness, 2,000 years. That's an awful long end time plan there. But that's the way the New, Church, New Testament church looked at it. Okay, we got the old times and then we have these last days. In these last days, he, God, has spoken to us by his son. It's kind of interesting. In the original language, it doesn't say his. I was doing some looking this morning and it doesn't say the, the son or his son. We've translated that because it rolls better in English. It says he has spoken unto us by son. <laughs> now, the, the, the cool thing is, is we know who that is, right? So a lot, a lot of your Bible translations will insert a the in there. He's spoken into us by the Son, uh, capital S, or by his Son, which makes a lot of sense. Jesus is the Son of God. He is God's Son. Um, the, word, the, the word or name Son is kind of an important uh, word from the Old Testament. The, the writer of Hebrews is playing off of Old Testament stuff all the time, because for the Hebrew, Jewish Christians, the Old Testament is their Bible at this point, right? New Testament is in the process of being written as we read this. Uh, he says, he has spoken unto us by his son. Uh, back long, long ago, uh, Adam was looked at as the son of God, a godlike figure. God made the world and the animals and the trees and all those things, and then God made a son, someone like him, right? That's kind of cool. As an image bearer, there's someone who's like God. I think we talked about this another Sunday a few weeks ago, months ago, whatever. Uh, we get to the time of the story of the nation of Israel. God calls the nation of Israel, my son. You know, he tells, tells uh, Pharaoh, let my son go out of Egypt. You've got him in prison there. You need to let him go now. I want my kid back kind of thing. It's cool. God looks at these people, this nation as, as, as related to him, his son, his child, his image bearer, right? Uh, you go forward in the scripture story. We have uh, King David, the very famous passage called the Davidic Covenant, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. David wants to make a temple for God, and God says, David, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to make a house, a dynasty for you, and you will have sons, and your sons will be called my sons. The Davidic kings through history were looked at as the son of God in a special way. So out of a nation of sons, there's one representative man who is considered the son of God on planet Earth. Okay? Not son of God, capital S, like divine, like deity, but there's a human there who is like the God on Earth. He's, he, he represents uh, uh, he, Humanity to God and God to humanity in a sense. The kings were standing in like, almost kind of like a priest role, but not really. The king, okay? He would stand in for God. 
Uh, so King David was like that. Solomon were like that. Problem is, of course, you go through history and you have these men who have the title, the son of God, and they begin to walk away from God, don't they? You got some kings that did some really nasty stuff, you know, and God had to judge them for it. You get into uh, Psalm 2. Psalm 2. I can read a, a verse or two of this one to us. It's a very famous passage, actually, that's, that's uh, quoted a number of times in the book of Hebrews uh, that talks about the son of God talks about the nations being in, in turmoil and fighting against God and his, his anointed one. Uh, God just laughs at it because it's not a big deal to him. And then verse 7, Psalm 2, verse 7. Psalmist says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Okay, now there's a big prophecy in here going on about the Lord Jesus. But the original context is the, is the Jewish king who is named God's son. And the nations are in turmoil and fighting. And God says, I'm putting my son on that hill over there on Zion and Jerusalem. And I'm going to give him the nations of the world. Prophetic talk, right? Originally, the, the son of God is this king. But God's prophesying through the, the, the kings of Israel that he is going to send the ultimate son, capital S, the ultimate king, capital K, you know, who will own the nations of the world, every last one of them. The ultimate divine representation on planet earth. Pretty cool. So we go forward in scripture. We have Jesus coming to the earth. Jesus is born in humble circumstances, born in a manger, you know, raised as a carpenter, nobody special. We didn't regard him as anything. And then he goes into the water at his baptism. And what happens? A voice speaks from heaven and says that one right there, that is my son. What is God doing? He's playing off all this sun language from the Old Testament, right? Jesus goes up on the mountain with his three closest disciples and, the, and, 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 and turns bright and shining like he was at, uh, in heaven. And God says, this is my son. Listen to him, you know. So Jesus is the son of God. You go back to Hebrews chapter one there. It says in the last days, in these last days, he, God, has spoken to us by his son. The idea here is that God who spoke through prophets in the Old Testament has left a final message on planet earth through a person. God's final act of revelation was a person. Uh, the book of John actually calls him the word, right? It says the, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then we have John 1 14. It says the word, what became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory, like the father full of grace and truth. Remember that? So the, the divine message, the last divine message, the big, the big message is God puts on flesh as the word and comes down here as the son, the Lord Jesus, God gave us a message big message. It's an important message. It is a beautiful message, right? Message of his love for us. God came here. Um, now, if you look at the, the rest of verse uh, two here, Hebrews one, two, in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. Let's look at that word heir for a minute. Back in the old Testament, we have the concept that sons, sons and daughters get an inheritance, right? Uh, I remember reading my Bible when I was a kid, I would have been about seven years old. And I, and I caught onto this idea that kids get an inheritance, you know, because Esau and Jacob and those guys, they're asking their dad, what's the inheritance, you know? So I went to my dad and I, I thought I sort of caught him. You know, I was like, hey dad, what's this inheritance thing about? <laughs> like, you're not telling me, you know, where is it type of thing? When do I get it? And what is it? And he's like, well, I'll have to think about that. You know, <laughs> go look in my bank account, see if there's anything in there. <laughs> inheritance. Okay. Sons and daughters get an inheritance right from their father. Uh, Jesus, the son has been appointed as the heir of what? All things. Uh, we read the passage there in Psalm two. It says that uh, son, I, I've put you on my holy hill in Zion. Ask of me and I will give you what is your inheritance? The nations of the earth right? There's coming a time where Jesus will come down as God's man, God's king, and he will inherit the nations of the earth. He will rule over all of them right here. That's his inheritance from his father. The, another passage, Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight and Psalm two have some correlations that are kind of cool. Uh, let's look down at, let's see, Romans chapter eight verse. I'm going to find it. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Romans chapter eight, verse 32. And before we do that, let's look at Romans chapter eight, verse 
16. Romans 8, 16. It says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay, so now we're called sons. We won't get into that one today, but we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. So there's inheritance. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So we're heirs of God and we get what Jesus gets. Fellow heirs with him, uh, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. So Jesus has an inheritance. Uh, Take that idea with you. Go down now to verse 32. It says, he who did not spare his own son. So the father didn't spare Jesus, but gave him up for us all. That's the greatest gift ever. How will he not also with him graciously give us what? All things. There's some tangled language in there. The language is ultimately, if I could put it into two sentences, Jesus will come and receive as an inheritance all things. God, who gave us his best gift, the Lord Jesus, how will he not give us everything else when Jesus gets it? Jesus is coming to get everything. So it's not just the nations of the world. Jesus will inherit something that is called all things. I don't even have to know what that is. It's just everything. It's the, the cosmos will belong to Jesus, right? And the point in Romans here is that we get that too with Jesus when he comes back. God, if he gave us his son, won't hold back on giving every, him and us everything else, right? We will get what Jesus gets. Pretty fantastic. So you go over to, to Hebrews there again. It says that he, he appointed Jesus, the son, the heir of all things. This is uh, looking forward to God's plan for the new world. And then he says, uh, through whom also he created the world. This guy is not pausing to explain a whole lot, is he? He's just dropping truth out there like one, two, three, big stuff, you know? I suppose you could write a whole book on on, on this thing, on on different little pieces here. Through whom also he created the world. Uh, Jesus was God's um, instrument for creating the world. Okay. What we're starting to see here is language that is usually associated with God is associated with Jesus as well. The point that he's making is that Jesus is God. Jesus is one and the same. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him. All things were made by whom? Jesus. Okay, the son is the one who spoke the words and the world came to being. We don't think about it that way, right? We think, well, God created and we kind of separate them out. And in, in, in John, it says Jesus did that. Uh, Hebrews says Jesus did that. Jesus is the one who created. Jesus is the creator. Uh, we we use, like to uh, tell our, our folks in the churches we're planting overseas that when you make something, then it belongs to you. You know, tribal culture, whatever, you can talk about, hey, this house that you made, this bow and arrow that you made, this boat that you made, you made it, so who's the owner? Well, I am, I made it, is usually the response, right? And we can make a point off of that. Hey, God made, God made what? God made all this, so who's the owner? God is, right? God's the owner of you too, by the way, okay? Jesus is the one who created all things. Now, we can turn over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, 16 has another one. If you don't want to flip around, you guys, if that's a lot, uh, that's fine. You can just write them down or just listen, whatever. That's that's cool, too. Colossians 1, verse 16. Uh, Let's start at 15. Colossians 1, 15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Jesus created everything, the stuff you can see and the stuff you can't see. All the powers, all the demons, all the angels, whatever else there could be out there. He did that. He made it all. So you go back to Hebrews. We're starting to put it together here a little bit. God has spoke a final word of revelation by coming down here as a human, by the coming down as the Lord Jesus through the son. God has given us the final message. Uh, The son is God's heir. He'll inherit everything. And the son is the creator. Now we're starting to put it together. Jesus is God. Now look at verse three. Look at verse three. It says, he, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God. Reading that one, it, I don't understand it exactly. It's kind of, it seems kind of tangled up. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. That doesn't make a, a whole lot of sense right away. Uh, what is the glory of God? The glory of God is God's brilliant, shining, holy presence. Hey, back in the Old Testament, there was actually a visible manifestation of that in the temple and the tabernacle, right? They, they built the, the tabernacle like God told them to, and then God's glorious presence, power came in, and there was a glowing light. 
in that temple that people could see. I don't know if they could see it outside shining out, but I kind of imagine they would. You know, sort of a glowing building there. God is in there. God's presence has come to dwell with us. Actually, when, they, when God led the nation of Israel out of Egypt, there was a glowing pillar of cloud that led them along too. God's presence led them, right? God's glory led them. There's one instance there where Moses and God are talking. Moses has a cool relationship with God. It says he could speak with God like a man would speak with his friend face to face, right? God had that with him. And uh, Moses, in one instance, uh, the, the people had been bad. The people had been disobedient. And Moses went to pray for him. And he felt very close to God at this point because God was responding to him. God, Moses like, God, please forgive them. And Lord's like, yes, I will. And the next word on a Moses mouth is basically, God, can I see you? Remember that one? It's like in Deuteronomy or Numbers somewhere. Like he, we've just won this big victory with God. You know, I asked him for a request and he gave it. So God, can I like, can I look at you? Like never seen you yet. You know, I love God's response. He's like, Moses, no one can see me and remain alive. Translation. If you looked at me, you'd die. Moses, you can't take it. I'm, I'm too big. I'm too much. Right. Uh, I'll show you the, you know, myself from behind as I walk by, I'll give you a little, a little glimpse there. He puts him in the, in the cave and goes by, proclaims his name. And Moses sees something probably, probably still way too much. Right. Uh, we have the story there of Isaiah when he's in the temple and he's, he's worshiping God. Whoops. Like we talked about. And, uh, and, and, and he, he looks up and there's God's throne and, and the big robe coming down and he sees the one sitting there. What does he say? A curse on me. Like kill me right now. I'm a sinful man. What am I doing here? You know? Um, it's the glory of God is too much. And Isaiah didn't even get to describing the face. He's just talking about the throne and you know what he can see from there. We have the, uh, the story of the Lord Jesus when he comes and he's transfigured and it's too much for the disciples. Remember that it's glowing and shining. And then Peter, of course, is talking as fast as he can because he's really nervous, (laughs) which is probably what I would do. Uh, Peter didn't know what to do with himself, scared out of his mind, you know? Uh, there's a, a, a famous passage in the end of Isaiah that talks about the day of the Lord, the Lord's judgment when he comes to judge the nations. And it says, God says, I will gather all the nations together and I will show them my glory. Well, that's kind of a weird way to say it. I will show them my glory, you know, and you get this idea like God has done something kind to them. And then the next verse says, and all the survivors from seeing my glory, you know, will go and do such and such. It's like, okay, he's showing them his glory and I killed them all, you know, this is, this is big glory. Okay, the glory of God is intimately related to who he is. It's God's eminence. It's God's, it's God's power. It's, it's, it's the light that's shining from him. It's related to his person. God is glory us, we can say. Here it says, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. The radiance that is shining from God's being, from God's person, from God's, from God's eminence, who he is, it is Jesus. Jesus is that. What we're doing here in the language is we're tying Jesus closely to God. By the time we get to the end of the verse, it's like, no, it's the same person. Okay. But you're looking at, it's like, okay, how can, how can God be God and Jesus be the radiance that comes from God? Like we're, we're pulling it in here. It's actually the same one. Jesus is something that comes from God that shows us who God is. Jesus is God in a body, right? Jesus put on flesh and came down here. I, I so love the incarnation, you guys, because God put on skin and came down in a relatable way. God didn't need to do that. God didn't need to dumb himself down. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, disrespecting Jesus when I say that, but in a sense, right? God put on skin and came down and wore our clothes and ate our food and all that kind of stuff. That's dumbed down for God. It really is. Like that's low, you know, being born down in a stable and eating our food. Like who would like our food? God's food is probably amazing. <laughs> you know, what does God do up there? I don't know, but it's awesome. And he comes down and does our thing and is relatable to us. That's, that's fantastic. So Jesus is the radiance from God. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Look at the next one. It says, and the exact imprint of his nature, exact imprint. Okay. Now we're putting the words together. The Jesus is God. The idea of an exact imprint is like, if you take a, uh, back in the day, they would have like a, a, a ring, like a signet ring with a stamp on it. You know, Kings would, uh, uh they'd make a, a letter or something and they'd put wax on there and they'd make a stamp to say, Hey, this is like my signature. This is me. I'm saying this. Do you? Do you have one? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Are you talking about the king who put the put the stamp on the on the um, the den so Daniel couldn't get out? Oh yes, that no one could pray to anyone. (laughs) 
<laughs> I like that. That's right. Now, those things are all through the Bible. There's guys using those stamps, right? They put a, a seal on the tomb of Jesus too to say the king says you can't come out and Jesus did anyway. I like it. So, so we have this print, right? We have this print. The print is like the signature. It's like, this is me. This is my identity. Jesus is the exact imprint of the nature of God. The only way I can, I can think about this is if God could put himself on a piece of paper, if God could stamp himself on a piece of paper, what's the stamp? Jesus. That's the idea. Jesus is like the stamp of God's nature. It doesn't just say the stamp of God. It says the nature of God, God's, God's being, who God is as a, as a person, right? God has a personality. God is a, a certain type of being way bigger than we can ever understand. But if God were to make a stamp of that, the exact imprint of that nature is, is just Jesus Christ. Jesus says to the disciples who are confused, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Remember that? Philip's confused. He's like, show us the father. Jesus like, I've been with you for three years. You've seen the father right here in the flesh, right? Okay. We get all over the disciples like, oh, those guys are so dull, you know, but I, I get it, right? They, they're used to the monotheistic idea. They're used to the idea of there is one God and we never see him. He is a spirit. That's all there is type of thing. And it's true. There is one God, but then when God puts skin on and comes down, it's a, it's a different revelation, isn't it? So Jesus, the son has come down as the, the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint, imprint of his nature. It says he upholds the universe by the power of his word or by the word of his power. Uh, same kind of an idea there. Upholds the universe by the word of his power. Colossians chapter one has a reference like this. Colossians chapter one, after Philippians, Dave, Colossians chapter one, verse 17, it says, and he, Jesus is before all things and in him, all things hold together. Jesus is the one who holds everything together in Hebrews, though it says it is, he upholds everything by his powerful word. Okay, God is the one in the Jewish scriptures in the Old Testament that holds the cosmos together. If God were to walk away, everything spin out of, out of control, right? God makes it rain. God makes the animals give birth. God, you know, makes the seasons happen and the sun come up and go down and provides the food for all of us. God holds everything together. Jesus holds everything together by his powerful word. What would happen if Jesus walked away for a second? We'd be in trouble right? Things wouldn't happen the way they should. The whole universe is held together by this one. We've come full circle. Who is Jesus? Who is the man Jesus? He is God. He's the son of God, but don't think less because we say son. He's God in the flesh. He is the God who created. He's the one. Um, Amazing things here are said about, about Jesus Christ. It's fantastic. He's the creator and he's the sustainer. Now look at the next (laughs) verse here. It says, after making purification for sins. The one who breathed out the galaxies came out and breathed out his last on the cross for us. How does that make sense? Why did he do that? Didn't need to. God is self-existent. God is fine on his own. He doesn't need humans. He doesn't even need our worship, although he likes it. He doesn't need us. But God who made us looked down and saw our sin and the mess we got into. And he says, I will come and do something about that. And he puts on a body and comes down. That is, I still haven't got over that one. My brain goes like the old television. You know, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what to do with that. Break your brain on it. Jesus came and made purification for sins. Now, purification is a, is a Jewish Old Testament temple word. The picture is, is that sin is a stain. Sin is a blot. Sin is a mess. It's impure. Impurity separates from a holy God who is nothing but pure. So for a relationship to happen with God, we have to have priests who stand in the middle between the holy God and the unholy people to make sacrifices, to wipe away the stain of the guilt and the sin so the people can go in there and talk to God. Middleman. Okay. Story of Hebrews. The whole story of Hebrews is that Jesus is the greatest high priest ever who came down and actually offered his own body on the altar for God to purify us from sins, not just once, but forever. So we could go into the presence of God, not just once, but forever and stay there with the father. (laughs) Jesus made purification for sins. Best gift ever. You read uh, uh, first Peter chapter, I think it's chapter one where he says uh, that not with the, uh, not with the, with money. 
You know, you're redeemed from the old ways that your ancestors had, not with money, not with silver or gold, but with what? The precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish and without spot, you know, sacrificed for, before the beginning of the world for us, something like that. Jesus made purification for our sins. I love the picture in the book of Hebrews that uh, I can't remember where it is. I guess I'm like the guy in the book of Hebrews in that way. I can say things like, you know, a certain man said somewhere. <laughs> don't have to remember the reference, right? It's biblical. Uh, Jesus, Jesus offers one sacrifice that's good enough for all of them. Uh, in, the, in the book of Hebrews, it says the priests have to go in every day and every day and every day, like over and over and over again. Do you realize the amount of work that those men went to? Standing there basically butchering animals all day long, all day long, all day long. That's what they're doing. Because that's the system to make purification for the sins, and the people keep sinning, and the sacrifices aren't enough. So we just stand here and do this. You know, and there's meaning to it and it's beautiful and it's fantastic, but look at the work, you know, and the, and you, and you can never get it right. You can never get it enough. And then it says, Jesus came down and did it once for all, for all time, like one sacrifice forever, you know, drop the mic. We're done kind of thing. Jesus, Jesus paid the biggest price ever. And it really worked because he's sinless. Um, I, I look at the story of the incarnation and the cross. And I just ask the question, how much does God want to relate to humans? I think a whole lot. He really wants to relate to us. Like, does that not make your heart swell with love for God? It does for me. Like you you get, you get off sometimes you get thinking about God. Maybe God's vindictive. Maybe God's mean. Maybe God's upset at me today because what I did, what I thought, what I said. And then you read stuff like that. You're like, I think God likes me. (laughs) And he sent his son to pay this great price to get a relationship with me. And what it does in my heart is I want to love him back. Right. And it affects my attitudes and affects my relationship with other people. Jesus made purification for sins. Oh, one more thing. After making purification for sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Uh, He makes the point later in the book of Hebrews that the priests have to stand all day chopping meat to pay for the sins. They stand. They keep standing because the work isn't finished. And he makes the point that Jesus did the one sacrifice and then he went and sat down because he's done. I really like that. Okay, now we're finished. Price has been paid. Christ offered once and sat down. Where did Christ sit? It says at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, now we're getting back into Jesus' God language again. Remember the famous passage where the high priest and Jesus are having a talk? It's actually when the, the day Jesus goes to the cross or the night before. High priest is trying to get Jesus in trouble, right? So at one point after they're wrangling around, trying to pin him with different things that he never did, the high priest says, I, I, I put you under oath in the name of the living God. Are you the Christ? Remember that one? I love Jesus' response. Just real quiet. He's like, yeah, you got that right. You said it, right? And after this, you will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, sitting on the right hand of the power. What does the high priest do? Oh, okay. Oh, high priest rips his shirt like, whoa, blasphemy. What have you said about yourself, right? Jesus is quoting something out of Daniel chapter seven. At risk of going a little, little longer here, I'm going to take us to, to there. Daniel seven is a really cool passage about the deity of the son of God. Uh, and the high priest knew exactly what Jesus was saying. The the Jesus comment wasn't missed on the high priest at all. Daniel chapter seven. uh, Let's see. Here we go. Right in the middle of a big vision that Daniel's having about the end times. uh, Verse 13, Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Uh, Jesus is constantly calling himself the son of man, which means the human basically. Okay. He, he calls himself that, but Jesus quotes this passage. In fact, the New Testament writers, if you, if you count up all the times Jesus calls himself son of man, Daniel 7, 13 becomes the most quoted passage in the mouth of Jesus in the entire Old Testament. Okay. So there came one like a son of man, Jesus, right? He came to the ancient of days. There's the father and was presented before him and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all nations, peoples, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. I love it. Jesus is the one who comes before the father and the father says, son of mine, here's the nations of the world. I give them to you. Your present, your inheritance, right? Jesus is the son. So when he stands before the high priest there and the high priest says, who are you? Jesus says, I'm the son. Uh, furthermore, you will see me coming on the clouds of heaven. That's an Old Testament thing too. In the Old Testament, there's only one being who rides on the clouds. You know who it is? God. God rides on the clouds. In Daniel, there's a surprise. There's a human riding in on the clouds. 
what? What's he doing there? You know? Cloud rider. That's only God. Oh, it's Jesus. Jesus. God the Son rides on the clouds and is given the inheritance of the nations of the earth. So after making purification for sins, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That is a place that is not reserved for people. That's a place that's special. So question, what is Jesus doing at the right hand of the Father? Romans chapter 8 has one thing anyway. Romans chapter 8. I wonder sometimes, you know, why Jesus didn't just die on the cross, pay, and then, and then stay here and put the crown on. That would be great. Start the kingdom right now, right? We're waiting for it anyway. Romans chapter 8, though, verse, uh, oh boy. If you know where I'm going, shout out the verse reference. It's in 8. There's a problem with not knowing the references once in a while. <laughs> here, here we go. Uh, verse 34, Romans eight thirty four. Who is to condemn? Who can condemn us, right? Who can bring any charge that sticks is the idea. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at where? The right hand of God, who is interceding for us. What is Jesus doing beside the Father's right hand there? Praying for you, praying for me. You guys, not only is the incarnation cool because Jesus came down with skin on like, like us. The incarnation is cool because Jesus, the incarnate man, the incarnate son of God is up there with skin on beside the father talking about all the other humans. In the presence of God, there is a man. I've got a man in my corner, a man on my team who's got my back, who's praying for me. And when Satan comes and tempts, Jesus is there praying for guess who? Me, because I need it. When Satan comes and brings a list of dirty laundry that Dave Field committed this week, Jesus can show his hands and Satan's got to go away. Jesus is there in my corner. He's interceding. He's on my team the entire time. Beautiful. First John talks about that. Jesus is our representative because we need one. He's there praying for us. And, and the scripture says other places that Jesus is there waiting to come back and get his inheritance. He's waiting till his enemies go under his feet and he'll come back and take control that God gives him. So application thoughts today. I know we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, I hope you've been encouraged. I, I, I thought, you know, this isn't really a sermon where we have a, a list of things to do after the sermon. Uh, but there are some encouraging thoughts for our heart that I think will, will, will spread out into application if we think about them and, and, and mull on them some. Uh, application number one. Jesus is God. Jesus is it. Uh, For the readers of the book who are tempted to leave Jesus and go to something else, now do you see why that's a foolish idea? I mean, I do, right? It's like, in my head are the words that Peter said to Jesus one time. A bunch of people are leaving Jesus because his teaching is too crazy for them, whatever, demanding too much. And Jesus Jesus says to Peter, you guys going to go away too? Peter says, where are we going to go? You're the ones with the, you're the one with the words of eternal life. You know, that's what I think about Jesus right now. After reading this batch, like where in the world would I go else except to you? You're the one I'm staying with you. And the longer I go, you guys in life, the more, the more resolved I, I am on that. You know, it's like, there's, there's no other place. I'm staying with him. And if, if it gets hard, I'm still staying with him. Cause I don't know where else I can go. It's going to be anywhere near as good, near as safe. Another one, uh, another application is uh, thankfulness. Um, thankfulness for redemption. Jesus came down and, and cleansed us from our sins in his own blood. I just am thankful every day for that. And then the other one is thankfulness for his representation before the father that he continues to do right now. I'm thankful for that. I don't know what would happen to us if Jesus wasn't up there representing us right now, but he is and things work. And I'm glad, uh, somebody famously said one time, uh, the father is, how does it, how does it say it? The father is, as, is happy with me as long as the son is there for me. You know, Jesus is before the father and the father really likes his son, you guys. And I'm with Jesus. So the father likes me too. That's kind of the image that, the, that I was trying to put across there. Hey, what would happen if Jesus could be like an Old Testament priest and get old and die? And we have to find another one. You know, then we're in trouble all over again until they find the right guy to rep me before the father. That's not the case. Jesus is the ever living priest who will never die, who is always likable to God, you know? And as long as God likes Jesus, God likes me. That's, that's important. So thankfulness, right? And then the last one uh, um, is, is looking forward to the coming. We as Christians have something that isn't talked about a whole lot, but we need to talk about it more in church and at, in our homes uh, is the idea of hope. Um, the hope of the church is the coming of Jesus to right things. 
And we don't think about that much, right? We think about Jesus died for my sins, and that's very important. But the second half of the story is Jesus will come back to make everything new. Uh, We are living in a world that is getting old. We're living in a world that is winding down. And if you read the rest of the story in the Bible, the world is going to wear out. War and disease and all those things, I mean, it's it's bad now. It's just going to get worse. It's going to wear itself right out. And then the Savior will step back in and says, okay, restart. We're going we're gonna to kick this thing off a better way it should be. And he'll bring in the new world. And we look forward to that. Because it's guaranteed for those of us who are with the Son of God. He'll come get his inheritance and we will get ours. Right? So there's encouragement for us in, in tough times. So that's what, uh, that's what we have today. Why don't we go ahead and pray and thank the Lord. Father in heaven, uh, our hearts are just filled with love for you, worship for you. You have done so many kind things to us. Lord, your word is, is full of encouraging um, thoughts for us to think on in our day. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here with me today that as life is difficult, we all came here with something this morning, Lord, baggage or background or struggles of different kinds. We ask that you would help us to lift our eyes from where we are and look on Jesus, the Son of God who loved us, gave himself for us, and is coming again to take us to be with him. Thank you for him, and we pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue our worship together.